Um, so now for our final session, we have Professor George Basilius all the way from across the pond uh, joining us this evening, his morning. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, George Basilius is a professor of apologetics and a published author of Timeless Truths in Truthless Times, um, in which he's answering really tough questions about God, Christianity and the Bible. In addition, George is a fantastic Christian apologetic speaker. So we always look forward to hosting his presentations at our conferences and seminars, all of which are on our YouTube channel. So please do check it out later. Um, today, George will be talking to us about the New Testament contextual criticism. So over to you, George, when you're ready. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be with you uh, this evening. It's morning where I live um, in San Francisco, California, but it's always good to be with you. Um, our, um, I have a um, great deal of uh, regard and admiration to the COAT team, so it's an honor to be with you uh, always. And I pray that at some point, hopefully soon, I can be with you in person. Um, I pray this happens soon. So um, I, I caught the last five minutes of the, of the previous discussion, and it was very uh, uh, enlightening. I, I, uh, I wish I had joined a little earlier. So thank you, Abuna, for, uh, for this uh, wonderful explanation um, of the scriptures and that journey on the scriptures, at least the last five minutes that I caught. Um, yes, I would like to talk, to talk to you about the an important subject um, when, regarding the infallibility and the authenticity of the scriptures. That's text, textual criticism. So let me ask you a question. Uh, someone comes and asks you and says, the Bible has been changed so many times over the last 2,000 years. It's impossible to know what the original text actually said. How would you respond to that? That's precisely what textual criticism is all about. And we will attempt to discuss textual criticism. What is it and what are the methods used in doing textual criticism? And then I will hope to leave some time at the end for, um, for questions and answers. Now, before I, um, I jump into this, I just want to make sure that you can hear me okay. Perfect. Yes, we very can. well. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's begin with uh, definition of our terms. What is textual criticism? Textual criticism does not mean that we're criticizing the text of the scriptures. Textual criticism does not mean that we're critiquing the Bible. It simply means thinking critically about ancient manuscripts in order to identify the original writings of the text. That's what textual criticism is all about. It basically says it tests for the reliability of the text. And how close is um, what we have, how close is it to the original autographs or the original text itself? That's what textual criticism is all about. Um, how do we do textual criticism? Well, there are two primary methods, two primary methods, and we can call them also two primary tests. The first is the internal evidence test. The second is the external evidence test. What do I mean by that? And we'll go through these one by one, and I will also give you some examples so that we can understand what I mean by that. The internal evidence test is uh, it, it tests for uh, multiple attestations to the text. Are there any contradictions? Is the text cohesive and coherent? Does it contradict itself? Does it say one thing in one book and a contradictory thing in another book? That's the internal evidence test. The external evidence test is that how it corroborates to um, um, the testimony of others. Um, um, evidence outside the scriptures, archaeological tests, scientific tests, historical tests, and so on and so forth. 
So what I would like to go over, again, for the sake of time, I may not be able to cover the whole thing, but I'll try as much as I can to go over um, some of the internal and some of the external um, evidence tests. Um, let's begin with the um, external, oh, I'm sorry, internal evidence um, and how cohesive and coherent and consistent the text is of the scriptures. Now, all Gospels agree on one thing. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the synoptics plus John, they all agree on one thing. And let me uh, share with you those, uh, well, not one thing, one theme rather, and let me share with you um, at least some of the themes that these four Gospels agree on, that the Lord Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. He chose 12 disciples. John, lived... sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. We don't, we are not, you're not sharing any slides, are you? I am not, not at this point. Okay. I will fine, in a second. Fine. I will okay. in a second. Just to confirm that. Thank you. Thank sure, you. I will in a second. Yes. Uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ openly taught his disciples and crowds. The Lord Jesus Christ did miracles to validate his message. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and died on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ was placed in a tomb for three days, and he was resurrected from the dead and appeared to his disciples. So the essential core events upon which the Christian faith stands are all coherent, consistent, reported in the four Gospels. Another test of coherence is how harmonious the entire scriptures are um, um, and, and amidst its, its enormous diversity. In other words, how, how we have this unity in this expansive, enormous diversity. And let me give you some examples. The Bible was written in three major languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Um, how many authors? 40 different authors have actually scribed the Bible. Uh, they held various occupations. You have the shepherds, the kings, the fishermen, the physicians. They lived on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. They wrote 73 books, of course, including the Ditcher Canonical, which we believe in. We as Orthodox Christians. Hundreds of topics were included in these books. Salvation, repentance, um, reconciliation, baptism, Eucharist. And they spanned over 1,500 years from around 1400 BC to 100 AD. So you can imagine the enormous diversity that was put into the scriptures. However, it contains flawless internal consistency and cohesiveness and congruency. Now, it doesn't contradict itself despite this extreme enormous diversity that it w went into play into putting the scriptures together. What do I mean by unity and cohesiveness? Well, there is one common theme and one common person. The theme is salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see that in 2 Timothy 3.15. From childhood, you have known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the one theme from Genesis through Revelation. There's one person that is the center of the entire scriptures from Genesis through Revelation, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. John 5.39. Our Lord said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Luke 24, 27, when Christ was talking to the disciple of Amos, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. There was one theme, one person, unity, in diversity. Now, this incredible harmony and this enormous diversity is an attestation to its divine inspiration. This cannot be just a coincidence. This cannot be just an accident. This points to divine inspiration, divine intervention. Um, that's why when we say that the text of the scriptures was God-breathed, 
That's what moved. The disciples were moved by the Spirit. They were, it was God breathed so that they, in conjunction, the disciples, with divine inspiration and guidance, the scriptures were born. Um, another test that I would like to share with you is how does the Bible compare to ancient literature? Part of, again, textual criticism is to see how does it compare to ancient literature? Uh, scholars um, uh, indicate that the Bible has far more manuscript evidence than any other ancient Latin or Greek literature. So if we deny the reliability of the New Testament, we also should deny every other historical record of ancient civilization. And here are some of those ancient manuscripts. I'm going to share my screen with you and go over some of those ancient manuscripts, what they are, and the date that, was, that, uh, that they were written, and the content they have. Um, give me just one second to share my screen. Share screen. And please let me know when you can see my screen. We can see it, too. Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Perfect. So the um, better. So you you see here that the, the manuscripts um, and uh, the date they were written and the content they had. So we have the Codex Alexandrinus, for example. It was written 480, and they contained the majority of the Old Testament and the entire New Testaments. Um, and uh, you have the Codex Sinaiticus, 350 AD, half of the Old Testament, the Septuagint Old Testament, and the entire New Testament. Codex Vaticanus as well, 325 AD, Chester B.D. Papyri, John Ryland's Papyrus, in 125 AD that had, it contained fragments of the Gospel of John. So you can see how many, uh, how early rather, how early these manuscripts were written and what they contained as far as fragments or portions or parts of the Old and the New Testament. What did these um, specifically, th these manuscripts, I think this is the next slide, they contained the following books. Uh, and uh, you know, I, can, I can share this with you, I can send it to you so you can have it as, uh, um, for, for your reference and for your records. These are the books of the um, New Testament, the date range determined by scholars, and this is the earliest known fragment, um, um, late tw second century, uh, 200, uh, 150 um, AD, 175 AD, and so on and so forth. You see basically the, how early these fragments and these manuscripts were written. Now, I'm just talking about the early dating I haven't mentioned yet how many of these manuscripts were found. I'll share that with you in a second. But the question here is, why is early dating important? Why is early dating important? Because there were eyewitnesses that can refute error if they saw or found or heard or read errors in the text. So let me give you an example. Christ's death, death and resurrection were, was around 33 AD or so. And the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, because I'm going to refer to 1 Corinthians 15 specifically, that speaks about the resurrection of Christ. Scholars um, debate when it was written, but they say it was between 52 to 55 AD. So that's about 20 years uh, period between the actual event and the text that describes the event that took place, which means that there were people um, present, alive, when the actual event took place that are there, present, and still alive when the text was written. So if St. Paul is writing to the Corinthians saying that Christ resurrected, he was crucified and resurrected, and so on and so forth, if this didn't really happen, they would have rejected what St. Paul is writing and they would have called him, you know, uh, a lunatic or crazy or fabricating stories. But none of, of, these, uh, of these people came out and said anything. That's because 
it actually happened. So early dating is very important because of the eyewitness testimony and how credible eyewitness testimony is. Um, so early dating speaks about the quality of the manuscripts, how ancient they are and how accurately they reflect what actually took place, what transpired. That's the quality of the manuscript. Now let's move from the quality to the quantity. Well, how many of these manuscripts do we have? Well, we know that it was written very early on, as I mentioned, John Ryland's papyri, papyrus was written in, in 125 AD. That's, that's, that's like news flash in, in today's terminology. That's almost right after the event uh, that took place. Well, um, how many of these manuscripts do we have? And I will give you a comparison here. I will also, um, I think it's the next slide. Yes. So we see um, Homer's Iliad. And you can see, I'm not going to go through each one of them. Here's the author. Here's the book. Here's the date that was written. And the earliest copies we have. And the gap in years. And the number of copies. And you can compare all these authors and books, including Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, and all of them. And you'll see that the New Testament was written between 50 and 180, give and take a few years. The earliest copy, John Ryland's copy, was found in 125 AD. Now, that's just 30 years gap in years. How many of these copies do we have? 24,000 copies of early ancient manuscripts that we have. Over 24,000. Um, I'm just rounding to 24,000. Now, that includes early translations to the Syriac, to Latin, to Armenian, and to Coptic. Um, and this is, um, this again speaks about the quantity of manuscripts. Why is the quantity important? Why is it important to have all of these manuscripts of our text in our hands? Because the more copies we have to compare with one another, the more confidence we have in the original autograph. And that's simply why it's important to have all of these manuscripts to see what did the original text really say. So it's not just the quality, how early it was written, but the quantity, how many of it do we have? Very important, two important tests, again, for textual criticism. So when scholars compare the thousands of New Testament texts to one another, they can then identify and resolve any variance in the text. And the original message can be reconstructed and, and identified. But if you, don't, if you have only one or two copies, then you don't know which, which is right, which is wrong. Maybe, maybe the text meant to say that. It, it didn't mean, the author meant to say something else, and so on. Um, B.F. Westcott, in his book, uh, um, um, he's a scholar in, in, uh, in textual criticism, in his book, The New Testament in the Original Greek, he has written the following. He said, if comparative trivialities such as changes of order, the insertion or omission of the article with proper names, using an, a different, definite article versus an indefinite article, and the like are set aside the words in our opinion still subject to doubt, still subject to doubt, can hardly amount to more than 0 0.001 part of the New Testament. So in other words, yeah, there's, there's, um, it takes greater faith for you to say that the text is incorrect than to say what I have is properly aligned, properly representative of, of, of what the original text was. Um, intended to, to convey. Let me give you an illustration to, to, to um, help explain and understand what I mean by the variance in those texts and the, the, the amount of manuscripts that we have. Um, you can still see my screen, I, I, I hope. Let's say, for example, um, my son, who's a school student, uh, he contacts me and he says, I, I need, I need $5,000 for my school tuition. So I go to the bank and I withdrew $5,000 and decide to meet him on Wednesday at the Starbucks on Main Street to give him the money for his tuition. So I send him some texts on my phone. The first text, text says, 
I got the, and I did a typo, you needed meet me at Starving on Main Street next Wednesday at 4 p.m. And I realized I did a mistake, autocorrect, whatever you call it. Now we know that's what the case is. And I send my son another text. And I tell him, I got the 5,000 you needed. Meet me at Starbucks on Main Street next. And I misspell Wednesday and I say weakness at 4 p.m. Now I managed to correct the two errors I made in the first text, but I have inadvertently typed weakness instead of Wednesday. So I sent him another text and I say, I got the 5,000 you need, you nerds. <laughs> Meet me at Starbucks on Main Street at Wednesday, uh, on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Now I'm done with my texts. Let me ask you an important question. Where do you think my son will be on Wednesday at 4 p.m.? Now, we know he will be at Starbucks on Main Street at 4 p.m. waiting for, faith, for his $5,000. So my son understands the original message I intended to write him because he had what? Multiple copies to compare to one another. That's precisely what uh, the, the, the quantity and the number of manuscripts, why the quantity of the manuscripts are, um, is very important to make sure that we compare those manuscripts, we compare the text to one another and see what the, or we can reconstruct the original message and see exactly what the author intended to convey and to say. Now this comparison with this example, this comparison quickly revealed uh, the, pre the pre precise location of my typos um, and, and because it, 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 it ident he was able to identify my, my, my misspellings or mistakes in my text, he was able to reconstruct the correct meaning of my text. Even though he did not have one single copy that was without error, but he was able to reconstruct everything because of the multiple manuscripts or multiple texts in this example. Um, I hope this clarifies the importance of having over 24,000 copies in, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our possession to see and compare what did the original autograph say. Now, um, another, um, another test or uh, maybe a, a subtest within the internal evidence test, we're talking about the quality and the quantity now let's go back to the quality as well and say, and quantity, maybe we can say both of them with this example. New Testament citations from early church fathers. Now let's just say, forget the actual text itself. Forget all the manuscripts that we have that, um, that contain fragments of the Old and the New Testament. What about the writings of the church fathers? Did they actually reference the text in the writings, will you better believe they did? Well, let's see who did what, when, and how many. Well, here are some of the church fathers, St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeo, St. Clement, and so on and so forth. Here's when they lived. And these are the gospel quotes that they had in their writings. And these are specifically the quotes from the book of Acts. So the four gospels and the book of Acts. Now, if you were, and this is what one scholar uh, who, um, who did a lot of uh, extensive research on this, and, and he mentioned um, that if you were just to collect all these uh, quotes and references from the church fathers, you can pretty much reconstruct 90%, I think he said nine, over 90% of the New Testament, even without having to look at the ancient manuscripts of the text itself. Um, another point I wanted to share with you, this is just, uh, we're talking again back to the quality and the quantity of um, the, um, the evidence here or the tests and the coherence of, of the New Testament text and the Old Testament text. Um, let's look at the early dating, timing, and let's do comparison between um, Christian and non-Christian sources. 
So we looked at the Christian sources, the early church fathers. Well, what about non-Christian sources? Did they actually refer to the events that took place in the Gospels? Did they or did they not? Who were they and how early was their writing? And what this is what this slide represents. Here you see the historian Tacitus, Josephus, especially Josephus. He wrote extensively about the life and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was not a Christian. He was just a mere Jewish historian in his Antiquities of the Jews. He wrote extensively about who Christ is, who Christ was at the time, and the miracles he performed, the crucifixion, and so many other things. Um, this is all in his, in his, in his uh, work, Antiquities of the Jews. Um, this is when they lived, and this is the subject that they wrote about, and these were just mere historians. So again, if you were not to, if, if you think the church fathers were biased because they're Christians, well, let's look at non-Christian historians and what they had written about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we take portion of the text from what they had written and quotes from the early church fathers. You have the scriptures right there for you without even having to worry about ancient text itself. A um, few other things I want to share with you before I uh, pause for, for questions. Uh, I'm not going to read specifically what Josephus had mentioned, but as I, meant, as I said, he, he talked about the crucifixion and the resurrection and the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to share with you a couple of objections and how to respond to these objections, but I don't want to respond myself. I would like to pause and share with you some objection, objections to the reliability of the text that I personally received. And I would like to see how would you respond to um, such objections. The first one, and you can either unmute yourself or you can type your response in the chat box. The New Testament writers were biased. You can't trust writings by those who were converted to Christianity. How would you respond to that? Anyone? Hi, George. Um, we can say that there is eyewitnesses that that was there. So they can they cannot be saying things which is could be a hallucination or anything. But there are some eyewitnesses that could have refuted, as you, you mentioned in the text. Um, some of the some of the um, the, the, the historical facts that mentioned in, in, the, in the New Testament about the death of Christ, about the life of Christ. So there are a lot of eyewitnesses there. So that's one thing. I'll leave the rest. Excellent. The, the, um, and the, um, the testimony of eyewitness um, bears a heavy weight in, well, at least in the, in the legal system and, of course, in um, uh, validating the authenticity of the text itself. Absolutely. Just had to add to that, um, it's not just the, the positive eyewitnesses, but you've got to remember that when the New Testament writers were, speak, uh, were first of all speaking and then writing, there still would have been many hostile eyewitnesses around. And if they'd said something which was outrageously wrong, like, for example, the, cl the classic one I always say is about the, the guard at the tomb, right, mm -hmm. in Matthew. If, or, and in later about the, the temporary, as I would say, temporary resurrection of the Old Testament saints that, that in Matthew as well. If that was so false, you could imagine that the um, eyewitnesses, which included obviously both Roman uh, pagans and Jews, would have made a big issue of it. Yet the only thing, the only tradition we have about the, the guard at the tomb is that they fell asleep. We find it not just in the, Old Te in the New Testament, but we find it... Um, uh, there's a couple of, uh, I think it's in, in uh, Justin as well, that they, that they fell asleep and um, that the disciples crept up and stole away the body. But you don't find a counter narrative saying, no, there was no, um, there, there was no God, do you? And you don't find a counter narrative saying, no, Jesus didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, etc., etc., etc. You don't find a counter narrative that say, Jesus wasn't crucified. I think this is important. But the point is, I, I was saying earlier when I was speaking, um, if you find 
corroboration from a hostile witness. You know, that is that that is even better corroboration than from uh, someone who's who's a friend. Right, and the only counter narrative that that came out and uh, that said Jesus wasn't crucified came six centuries or or seven centuries. Well, no, it, it comes in the second century, but it comes by from a man for um, Basilides, who's a Syrian Gnostic, and he states it in Egypt, but he's stating it a hundred years after the event, mm -hmm. and he states it for theological, stroke philosophical reasons. And the point is, he only says it after, um, and he said it was Simon Sarini who appeared. But he only says it, is it during the reign of Hadrian, according to Irenaeus, he only says it after um, Jerusalem has been destroyed in AD 70. So we can't, we can't prove, uh, you know, if, if the tomb of Simon Cyrene was there. He said after Cyrene is destroyed in 117 by the Romans after a Jewish revolt there. So, you know, he, there's no way to prove, he, he, he can't go and find the family of, of Simon and say, hey, look, look here's, his, here's his tomb, because the two cities have been destroyed, haven't they? So he's very careful when when he says it, but look also why he's saying it, and also look far above all, he's too late to say it. He's not an eyewitness. He claimed he had an eyewitness, but um, you know that's it. That's all it is is the claim. He's too late. Excellent. Thank you, um, Rami. You, you have your hand up. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, George. Um, I got as well uh, the idea that uh, if you are biased, you will get um, some sort of benefit. Actually, the, uh, the, the, all of them were persecuted. They um, had a terrible life, uh, very difficult. Uh, all the disciples were uh, martyrs, and uh, uh, except St. John, uh, 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 all of them, uh, um, like uh, Thomas, was uh, uh, cut into half in India and uh, uh, Peter was uh, crucified upside down. They all got um, uh, uh, persecuted and had a very difficult life. Uh, so they would uh, not be biased. Uh, you, you can't die for a false idea or for something that is not true. You can uh, go all the way up to death. And then if it is not true, you wouldn't put your life for it. And as they say, martyrs and uh, hypocrites are not made from the same material. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. And, and you're absolutely right, Rami, that they had no motive whatsoever to lie. Uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't receive any perks <laughs> um, for, for, their, uh, for their lying. Uh, all they received is, is mistreatment followed by death. And uh, you're absolutely right. And I would actually even ask the question, um, because ask another question, because the, the questioner or the objection says the New Testament writers were biased. You can't trust writings by those who were converted to Christianity. I just simply would want to ask, why were they converted? And maybe expound on that. Maybe there's a good reason for them to, um, to be converted to Christianity. Maybe I need to explore that myself. But you're absolutely right. There's nothing to gain nothing to benefit by writing what they have written and um, reaping the, the cost of their, of their faith. Excellent. Here's another objection. Uh, and these are actual objections that I received. I'm just sharing them with you. Um, we don't have- George, the... Sorry, um, Iheb, Iheb has his hand raised. Oh, sorry, Iheb, uh, my, my apologies. I don't Iheb mind if you continue. So um, I was just gonna raise something that you may have touched upon two points. One is the principle of embarrassment. They weren't, afraid to uh, say negative things. Uh, St. Mark was uh, ran away almost naked. Um, the disciples uh, betrayed the Lord and St. Peter, one of the most notable ones, denied him. Uh, the resurrection was eyewitnessed only by women. A lot of these things we don't consider that much, but they were fundamental in that day and age. The, the other thing is to ask, well, how can we show that they were eyewitness accounts? And one of the things that I think I've discussed with you and you've discussed with us, um, George, is um, the um, use of names in the New Testament that point to um, just the, the, the amount of very specific use of names um, where John is mentioned because John was a popular name in that time within 25 to 30 years. Uh, the Bible says, oh, um, John the Beloved or John the Baptist or John of or John of and all the popular names that were used in that time um, meant that uh, so for example if we look at the Deutero the um, 
apocryphal writings. They hardly mention names, they hardly mention places, they don't get their distances right, they don't get things like that. So that helps corroborate the idea that these are eyewitness accounts. So even if they try and shake the idea that this was not an eyewitness account written at the time, this is um, some evidence there as well. Excellent. Just, uh, if, if, if this book um, by Richard Balcom, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, that mm. goes into exactly the points you just made, uh, uh, Ihab. Excellent. I'm sorry, what was the title of the book again? Um, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by the, the scholar uh, Dr. Richard Balcom, one of the foremost um, British scholars, uh, academic scholars of, of the biblical studies in, in, well, in the world, in fact. Recently, he's retired just a few years ago, but still producing great works like this. But it makes the very points that you that Fad, that Ihab has just made. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing this. Um, excellent. Um, um, anybody else? Uh, let's go to the or before we go to the second objection. All right. Um, we don't have the original texts. Autographs of the New Testament are gone. All we have are copies. What do you say to that? I think this basically is a summary of what we had just been discussing for 30, 30 minutes. So what do you say to that? All we have are copies. I would say it's a uh, blessing that we don't have the original copies. There's no one who could um, edit them, corrupt them, or change them. So the copies are, are more valuable in that sense. Excellent. I like the way you think. Yes. It's a good thing that we don't have the original because they could have been um, sorted. Yes, excellent. Could have been corrupted. Where are multiple copies? Uh, we'll give you the corroboration that we just discussed. Excellent. Um, Abuna has his uh, hand up. Yes. Abuna, Abuna, please. Um, as you said, George, you said that in your presentation that you know if we take the quotes from the church fathers, they wrote most of the uh, verses of the, especially the New Testament, you know, apart from 14, 15 verses, something like that. So again, it's taken from the church fathers. They, they, they wrote that and they are they were different, different places, different person, different, okay. So I think if we collect all that from what they said, we can get the whole New Testament, you know, apart from a few verses, 14 verses, something like that. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. We have that source as well. Uh, Mona, thank you, Abuna. The vast number of the manuscripts um, is a testimony for the authenticity and also the short gap between um, the, the actual event and the, uh, uh, the number of manuscripts that has been um, uh, found very shortly afterwards. Excellent. So the gap in years and the number of manuscripts, put these two together, in addition to quotes from other sources, Christian and non-Christian, put all this together. And, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll mention that statement. If after all this, you continue to reject the scriptures because you think it contradicts itself, I would say that you would reject the scriptures not because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts you, you see? And it's, uh, I think St. Augustine said it beautifully. He said, we like to come to the truth when it illuminates us, but we reject the truth when it convicts us. So it, it really does take a greater faith, leap of faith in the dark to say that the scriptures were fabricated. And I think, was it... Um, Dan Brown, I believe in his book, The Da Vinci Code, I'm sure you've heard of that book, who said, oh, the, the scriptures were fabricated by some peasants in the fourth century and they are not, have nothing to do with divine inspiration and so on and so forth. Had he done his homework, had, uh, had he been seeking genuinely the truth of the text, he would have um, found out that this is not just a book that was written by some peasants in the fourth century, as he said, but this is a divinely inspired book that speaks the truth of God. And um, if I just may you know, say, when people ask me as an Orthodox Christian, 
um, what's your your conviction or your your belief when it comes to the scriptures? I I say the following, and I try to summarize basically my belief in the Bible in in the following sentence. I believe that the in the Bible as inspired by the Holy Spirit, canonized by the church, interpreted by the fathers, and lived by the saints. That is what I believe as far as my Bible. Again, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, canonized by the church, interpreted by the church fathers, and lived by the saints. So um, you cannot take any one of those four elements out of the scriptures. They all give me a perfect um, image of what the word of God is about. If I need to understand applications, you read the lives of the saints. If I need to understand difficult verses, read the commentary of the church fathers. If I need to know which book is authentic, which one is not, read, read about the canonicity of the scriptures and so on and so forth. All of this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, as I promised, I, I, I'm not sure if I have any time um, left. Um, Betty, Ehab, uh, let me know if, if we yes, have any questions. Yes, you yes, do. Have, yes, you have time. We have, we have. <laughs> please so if you have on. any questions, um, uh, uh, please feel free to ask. And we have our fathers here still with us, so they can also um, uh, give us from their wisdom as well. Thank you. Thank you, George, so much um, for a wonderful uh, talk, giving us really helpful and practical ways to communicate and discuss the reliability of the Bible. Um, I, I had a question. Um, how can we answer the argument that the gospel or the message of the gospel hasn't um, evolved to include aspects of the divinity of Christ, um, such as uh, but, uh, but uh, Ehrman's argument would be, so we see the Gospel of St. John, who who wrote maybe later on, including a lot more um, aspects about the divinity of, of Christ than um, earlier Gospels. Right. Uh, excellent question. And we need to understand why. Uh, because at the time of St. John's writing, there were several heresies regarding the divinity of Christ that were not there as much during the writing of the synoptics. So it wasn't just like, you know, St. John woke up one day and said, let me write about the divinity of Christ. It's because there were several heresies at the time um, uh, rejecting the divinity of Christ. But um, I can argue and say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do contain several passages that point to the divinity of Christ as well. It's not just the Gospel of John. Um, the divinity of Christ um, um, was, we, we, I can give you some examples, um, him forgiving sins. And, uh, and, and the, the audience around him knew that no one can forgive sins but God. But he boldly would say, to several, your sins are forgiven. The paralytic, for example, your sins are forgiven. What are you talking about? Only God can do that. Well, for me to prove to you that I can do the invisible forgiving sins, I will show you the visible, which is take up your bed and walk. So for me to prove to you that I can perform that which is seen will prove to you that I can also perform that which is unseen, the forgiveness of sins. So... It's um, so many, him accepting worship. When people worshiped him, again, throughout the three Gospels, forget the Gospel of John. Um, he didn't say, don't kneel to me, don't worship me, worship God only. He didn't say that. He accepted worship, and only God uh, is worshipped. Um, several others, um, when, when he said, who, who, who can convict me of sin? Who is the only sinless being? Now, that's a bold statement. We're all fall. We've, we've all fallen under sin, and we, we all fall, you know, from from the law. But but he 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 was again bold in those claims. Um, what's interesting is that the Jews, at the time, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all the audience, the crowds, 
they understood quite well what he was saying. And the reason, uh, and back to the Gospel of John, um, especially John chapter 8, when, um, when they took stones to want to uh, stone him, it's because he made himself equal with God. Now, they understood his claim. Now, it's interesting how um, at the time they understood what he was saying, and now, um, centuries later, we're saying that maybe, maybe he wasn't sure about his claim. Maybe he wasn't very clear about his, his divinity. Um, at the time, they were, there was no doubt that he came to claim um, 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 his divinity and his, his, his equal um, nature with, with the Father. And there's so many other references um, that maybe I can share with you, but this is just... Um, thank you. Stress. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Anthony McCroy? Uh, yes, just to add to that, I, I often get this put to me by Muslims in Stratford. And what I say to them, uh, first of all, look where the Gospel of John is written. It's written in Ephesus. Yes. Ephesus had a massive um, theatre which seated 25,000 pe people, which was a huge number. Even now it'd be huge. But for that, for the time, it was absolutely massive. And Ephesus was the, um, to put it in British terms, the West End of its day, or to put it in our uh, American friends' uh, uh, terms, it was the, the Broadway or the, the Hollywood of its day. Now, therefore, the Gospel of John is written in a different form than the Synoptics are. It's written in the form of a Greek tragedy. And one of the things you do in a Greek tragedy, you'd start off by saying in who, the name of the God in whom it's written, to whom it's dedicated. And it starts off right away in, in, the, in the prologue. You know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So we know that the, the God he's doing it is the word. But the point is, you know, he's, he's expressing himself more in a Greek way there because he's speaking to a largely Greek audience and he's using a Greek form. But if you go to the synoptics, it's not just a question of Jesus saying who he is, but like, uh, like George has pointed out, not just forgiving sins. But the other thing is he walks on the water, which is something that only Yahweh does in the Old Testament in Job, Job chapter nine. Um, he stops, st stills a storm, which is something only Yahweh does in Psalm 107. Uh, there's an excellent book, I can't recommend any books. This is by Dr. Simon Gathercole called The Pre-existent Son, which specifically looks at the Christology of the Synoptics and proving the deity of Christ along the lines I've suggested. So that's very important that is it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they look not so much at what, at what Jesus says about himself, but what he does. Because it's easy to say, I'm God. But the point is, prove it. Do something that only God does. And I often say this, I mean, I've said this last week, I'll we'll say it's a group. I said, Jesus does things that only God does. That's unique because they, they say to me, well, you know, Moses walked, uh, walked uh, through the Red, Red Sea. I said, yes, but that was a miracle that, that any prophet could do. But you don't find Moses walking on the waves of the water. You don't find Moses stopping a storm. Only God, Yahweh, does that. But Jesus does those. So that's, that's it's like creation. It's unique to God when he does those things. So it, it's not just by his words, but by his acts, by his deeds, he dem demonstrates he's God. And that way, in that way, the synoptics produce exactly the same high Christology that we find in, in John. And that's why I've often said that Bart Ehrman is inaccurate in pr pr proposing this evolutionary Christology. Because you find that high Christology right from the start. You find the fact that Jesus says in Matthew 11 and, and the, the equivalent in Luke, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father. The fact is the Son, to know who Jesus is, it's got to be revealed. Remember, that's why I have it at the baptism. This is my son. Well, again, and that's repeated at the transfiguration because Peter, it says he's out of his mind. He just looks at Elijah, Elijah and, and Moses. He says, can I make, create free tabernacles for you? As if Jesus was equal to these two prophets, or rather those two prophets are equal to Jesus. And then the voice comes from heaven. This is my son. Listen to him. <laughs> you know, or rebuking him because he's not just a prophet. He is the son, the eternal son. Because in other words, to know who Jesus is, it has to be revealed. And that's why when he's born, it's revealed but through an angel to the shepherds. It's revealed by, through a star to the Magi. And notice what the Magi do when they come to him, to this toddler. And to the eyes of, of human eyes, he's just a toddler. But they offer him gold, frankincense and myrrh. And that was the sacrifice, sacrificial offering 
that the Seleucus II, the king of Colossyria in the third century BC, offered at the Temple of Apollo. So th it's not gold for a king, etc. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh is what you offer to a god. And that's what the Magi did. And then it says they worshipped him. And that's important. Next, again, but it has to be revealed to Simeon. He's just holding a baby in his arms, isn't he? But it's already been revealed to him that he won't die till he sees the Messiah. And then he comes prophesying. In each case, this, we come back to Matthew 11. No one knows the son except to whom the father reveals them. That needs to be revealed. And in each case, it's a miraculous revelation. Now, so, to some who didn't, didn't see, see uh, others like the high priest just saw this man in front of them. They didn't recognize who it was because it, he hasn't been revealed to him. But remember what Jesus says to, Joseph, uh, to Peter, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. The point is in the end, though, that Jesus says that no one knows the father except the son and no one knows the son except the father. In each case, to know who Jesus is to, or to know who the father is, it has to be accomplished by supernatural revelation. And the fact is, I could I've not met George ever before, but if I was to meet him now and in the flesh and I'd know him, we could get to know each other. But I, I would just see I'd uh, see a man in front of me and he'd see a man in front of him. But in the case of Jesus, it's not through eyesight and it's not through hearing. It has to be by supernatural revelation. And that is only true of God. So that is an evidence that when Jesus says that uh, and, and also the evidence is that will it happen, that Jesus is God. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you so much. I learned myself quite a bit. Um, thank you so much, um, Anthony. This is this is wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, Abuna Shnuda, you have a, a comment to make? Yeah, ju just, you know, as, as uh, Professor Anthony said and Professor George said, I mean, the accusation against our Lord Jesus Christ was that he making himself equal to God. This is number one. I mean, in, in, in other Gospels is, is written. And also, our Lord knew their thoughts. Because, you know, as you said, when he told them, which is easier to say, if sin, sin forgiven you, or rise and, and carry your bed and, 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 and walk. So again, he knew what they are thinking about. Thirdly, and again, in Simon's uh, house, he knew what Simon the Pharisee was thinking about. So if he can read their, their, their thoughts, again, he is God. No one can do that. Thirdly, in the... In, 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 in the uh, annunciation of Archangel Gabriel, St. Mary. It was very clear. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the, 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 power, the, um, the, the, the power of the most shadow will over... Uh, the, the, sorry. Of the most high will overshadow you. Yeah, uh, uh, the, 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 will overshadow you. That, that's the, the, the one who is born of you is the Son of God. So again, it's very clear. The last one, the, 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 the miracle which was... <clears throat> mentioned in the four Gospels, feeding the multitude with five loaves and two fish, definitely it proves that he is God. No one can do that except our, you know, God himself. And, and this is, again, something uh, can prove. I mean, from uh, and there are many, many other proofs, but just, you know, a few things came to my mind that, you know, uh, from the other Gospels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from an attendee. Um, what are your thoughts on the thesis that the Quran originated as a Gnostic Christian text, given that it contains many heretical doctrines about Chris, Christ's nature? Um, I can say that um, the, I, I believe in the latter part of that question, that it does contain heretical text. Um, I am not sure that I would consider it to be uh, a Gnostic text a text rather. Um, that's the first I uh, first time I hear that. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Father Anthony, Father Shenouda, if you wanted to uh, add to that, but I haven't. I have not heard that it's a Gnostic text at all. So, so which but which text is this? Sorry, the, I missed that. Uh, the Quran. The Quran. Um, no, I don't. Well, my my PhD. By the way, George, my PhD is in Islamic studies. Um, oh, okay. yeah. But but my. Uh, my bastards in biblical sense. No, I don't think it's Gnostic text. It's because Gnosticism had basically ceased to exist by this time. Um, I'm actually of the opinion I've done. Um, it's actually a, a heresy from Syriac Christianity. Mm -hmm. 
uh, both, not, not all three of them, uh, Nestorian, Miaphysite, Melkite, Chalcedonia, if you like, but it is basically, um, it uses phraseology from Syriac, Syriac works, even like the, the story of the Seven Sleepers of Ephesus. It's quite clear from the, uh, the text of the Quran that it was, it was familiar with the, diff, with the cor contrasting Miaphysite and Nestorian stories about what the numbers were, for example. So I think that it's largely um, a heresy out of the blue from Syriac Christianity, but it's not anything to do with the Gnostics because the Gnostics have ceased to exist by this time. That's it. I don't think we can uh, we can say that. So no, it's um, that would be my view. I, 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 we'd, we'd, we'd have to I'd have to hijack the whole conference to go further. But so I don't want to, I want to leave time for George to say what else he wants to say. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, George, uh, for being with us. Um, do you have any other final words for us? Um, no, this is, I mean, thank you for um, giving me the blessing to be with you and, and um, this wonderful um, conversation about the, um, um, you know, the word of God. Uh, I appreciate, always appreciate seeing, you know, you, like I said, um, you know, the coat team is very dear to my heart. So I, um, um, I, I pray for uh, the ministry of, of coat and in this difficult day and age, um, we, we need, we need more people like you. So, um, God bless your ministry. And, and I just ask you to remember me, uh, in your prayers and, and thanks again for having me this evening. George, there's thank no way I'm going to miss an opportunity to thank you. I'm, I've just come back online. Um, I'm sorry, I had I had pastoral uh, responsibilities. I've just officiated a wonderful engagement at St. Mary and St. Shanula Church in Coolsden. Uh, I've had just heard the, the last bit of that conversation, but um, uh, George and Anthony, to see you two as a double act is inspiring, uh, to, say, to say only a few words. And it's wonderful to have you, George. Um, always so proud to have you here. And you are very much right. You are part of the Code family. And um, thank you for always making time, uh, regardless of a, a, a baffling time difference. Um, I haven't attended the whole conversation, but from what I have heard, it's been enriching as always. And it's good that we have this forum where we can ask and speak with one another and share. Uh, and I think the most important thing on our Christian journey is that we, we support one another in the questions we all have. And we support one another in the questions that others have. And in this fellowship and in everything we do, um, we're really just trying to project the light of our Lord Jesus Christ into the world, uh, especially at a time when it needs it so incredibly much. And uh, to show that there is hope and that, of course, there is a need for us to focus on detail but what I see everyone coming back to both this morning and in the very brief time I've spent with you now is back to the, the message of the scriptures, the message of the gospels. And, and that's what it's about. It's not just a text, as we heard from, uh, from Anthony this morning. And this is not just a text. It is a whole message of Christ. It's the life of the incarnate word among us. And that's what projects this incredible hope into the world that he's come to reconcile us to himself so um, thank you both very much and, and as always uh, thanks to the co team mm. um, who do such an incredible job uh, on a weekly basis but then it comes together in this forum that we have regularly to each other with each other so Fadi and the whole team thank you also very much thank you Sid. it was always always great to see you so um, a pleasure to uh, to be with you. And give my love to Miranda and the boys, of course. I sure will. She does the same. Thank you, Sayedna, and the wonderful speakers, and all of you for tuning in on Zoom and on YouTube and Facebook. Um, I really hope you've all enjoyed the afternoon and have learned something new to, to share with loved ones. Um, um, before before we close, I, I'd be again greatly appreciated if you could take a moment to fill in the short survey which will appear on your screen as the as the meeting ends, I believe.